Okay then, um, just to say um, good evening to everyone um, and welcome to the second um, uh, of, of our 2021 talks in the MMT our February talk. Um, our speaker this evening is um, Philip Mansell, who is one of the UK's leading um, historians on, um, of, of leading experts on French history. Um, I first met Philip um, in 2019 um, on an MMT trip to um, Farnborough Hill and uh, St Michael's Abbey in Farnborough, which is the, um, the home of Eugenie, who was the widow of Napoleon the uh, Napoleon the Third, and I subsequently met Philip at the uh, at a literary festival down here in Bridport in Dorset, where I where I live, where um, Philip was um, giving a talk about his um, it, what was then his latest book, which was a biography of Louis the Fourteenth. Um, at the time, I thought uh, a bit like one does when one hears of biographies of um, Henry the Eighth. Um, uh, wives and Henry VIII and Marie Antoinette. What on earth can there be more to say about Louis XIV? But in actual fact, having read the book, it is absolutely stunning the amount of detail and um, it taught me an awful lot that I didn't know about um, Louis XIV. So um, I'm hoping that uh, um, Philip's talk now on French funerals will be just as, just as enlightening. Uh, before I hand you over to Philip, can I just say, um, if you have any questions for Philip, can you use the chat button at the bottom of the screen um, to and just type in your questions, and I'll give those to Philip at the uh, at the end of the um, at the end of the talk. Anyway, if I can hand you over to Philip, welcome, Philip. Thank you very much, Ian. Thank you for the introduction. It's a great honour and pleasure to be speaking to the trust, of which I'm a very admiring member. And I'm talking tonight about French royal funerals between triumph and disaster from Louis XIV to Louis XVIII. And in fact, going on a bit after Louis XVIII. And it's not just about the funerals and the monuments or lack of monuments. It's also about the politics of them. Because as I was researching this, I was aware how France, a country very political, anyway and doubly political because of the number of its revolutions. How you remember dead monarchs is a political act to this day in fact. So I'm going to tell you a story of marble masterpieces, funeral processions and skulls as you will see. And I'd like to begin with the death of Louis the fifth, Louis the 14th. Uh, this is a a medieval royal funeral, they were very splendid. Sometimes the king in effigy continued to be served meals as if he was still alive until he was actually buried. This is the funeral of Louis, Louis XIV's wife, a picture in the royal collection. The procession is going from Versailles, which he made the seat of the monarchy, to the Abbey Church of Saint-Denis, where almost all French kings had been buried since the Merovingian dynasty in the 7th century. And Louis XIV had a magnificent, this is a procession, this is the procession of the king's grandson in 1712, because there were many deaths in the French royal family, largely due to incompetent doctors. This procession went through Paris, because the grandson was much loved, but Louis XIV did not. Maybe it's not completely certain because people knew the king's memory wasn't unanimously revered. Um, so it goes along the edge of the Bois de Boulogne from Versailles at night to Saint-Denis on the 9th of September, 1715. And then there were, there it is again with a magnificent catafalque, the guards, the court officials, members of his family, the representatives of the poor. And there were funeral orations in his honor, 
of the très puissant et très auguste prince Louis XIV, not only all over France, but also in the Spanish monarchy ruled by his grandson from Mexico City to French churches abroad in Istanbul, Jerusalem, and Aleppo, for example. Many admiring uh, words of praise for Louis XIV, his superb palaces and his reign, it was said by one preacher, was superior to England's badly understood liberty, unending source of discord. But in contrast to the procession's outward dignity, on all sides along the route, from Versailles to Saint-Denis, it had been a very long reign. Many people were thrilled to be rid of him. There were people laughing, singing, drinking, and playing music, according to Voltaire, who was one of them as a young man. Resent resentment of his wars and taxes and oppression lingered among his former subjects. Even in the official register of the master of ceremonies, Mr. Desgranges, he wrote, the people regarded it as a festival and full of joy at having seen the living king, that is the young Louis XV, did not feel all the sorrow which the death of such a great king should cause. And a police official, Monsieur Narbon, said, many people rejoiced at the death of this prince and on all sides you could hear the sound of violins. So right from this funeral, we have a controversy. Some people respected the dead king, probably more people were dancing and singing and drinking in Rejoice. And there's many very rude poems about Louis XIV. Here in the same tomb lie the great Louis and the finances. He, in Saint-Denis as at Versailles, he is without heart and without entrails. That refers to the French royal tradition of removing, embalming the king's body, removing his heart and entrails and burying them separately from his body. His body is in Saint-Denis, but his entrails were at Notre-Dame. And this is a statue by Quasavo of Louis XIV done just before he died in the choir of Notre-Dame. Even the French revolutionaries didn't destroy this marble masterpiece. And it's there because his entrails were buried in Notre Dame. Notre Dame as a sort of mother church of the monarchy. And there was a picture there commemorating Louis XIII's dedication of France to the Virgin. So the Virgin was Queen of France. And um, this vow dedicating France was, was renewed every year by each of the kings, his successors. So Louis XIV and Louis XIII are, can be seen now in Notre Dame in the choir, and I don't think they were damaged by the fire. And his heart was taken to the main Jesuit church of Paris, Saint Paul, Saint Louis in the Marais, which is still there, but the heart was destroyed and I think devoured during the revolution. The golden urn containing it was melted down with the general destruction of French royal relics. But you see the kings of France were treated as sacred figures whose, whose uh, members were, were divided and spread around the kingdom as if they were saints relics. And there were magnificent funeral ceremonies in the 18th century. This is for the Dauphine, this daughter-in-law of Louis XV. This is in Saint-Denis. You see really the theater of death. Nothing could be more magnificent. It is, it is a full performance put on for the benefit of the court and the public. And Louis XV dying in 1774, it's a rushed funeral because he had had smallpox, within two days his body is rushed to Saint-Denis. But there is a grand funeral ceremony at Saint-Denis later, um, which is also a political occasion because 
there was a new parliament or law court which Louis XV had been installed and as Anne Byrne shows in her book on the funerals of the King of Fr Kings of France um, everybody was watching to see whether the princes of the blood acknowledged the presence of the new parliament or by how deep a nod or bow and I think his procession was not treated very respectfully by the people lining the route from Versailles to Saint-Denis. So that's two funeral processions of kings of France, which are not really triumphs for the monarchy. And of course, the execution of Louis XVI, 1793, this is a print by Hellman, which was actually presented to the convention later in the year, 21st of January, 1793. The king's final words are drowned out by a roll of drums. It is the nadir of the French monarchy, humiliating, silent crowds. Nobody makes an effort to rescue the king. It seemed as if the Bourbons were finished. And later that year, Hubert Robert, the great painter of ruins, paints the violation of the royal tombs in Saint-Denis. It seems incredible, but 52 kings and about 70 princes and princesses' tombs were destroyed. You can see workmen uh, lifting them up, and then the remains inside were put into a common grave just outside Saint-Denis. Again, humiliation is heaped upon humiliation. Uh, this picture is in the Musée Carnavalet, the wonderful Paris town museum which also has relics of the Bourbons and here is uh, a, a drawing by Alexandre Lenoir who's a French museum curator who is trying to bring together the, rema the remains of the tombs of Henri IV as he had been embalmed but all these bodies were just thrown aside destroyed and lost However, 1814, Louis XVIII returns in triumph from England. The monarchy is restored. For a time, it seems secure. And one of his concerns is to rebury his relatives. It's not true what John Hardman has said in his biography of Louis XVI, that um, Louis XVIII did nothing for his brother's memory. 21st, uh, First of all, the common grave is dug up. A commission claims to have found the bodies of Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette. How they were identified, I'm not completely certain. And the 21st of January, 1815, that is on the day of the guillotining uh, 20 years earlier, they are, there is a ceremonial reburial in Saint-Denis exactly according to traditional habits of the House of France. The catafalque is magnificent. You can see it here. This is a drawing by Dugourc, who is a very interesting artist who had worked for the Bourbons before the revolution and does many designs under the restoration. It's the first day that um, the revived household troops of Louis XVIII are seen by the public and it's extremely cold. Marshal Ney said that it reminded him of the retreat from Moscow. It was so cold. And again, it is a political act. Some people criticized it. An English resident of Paris wrote that it, it is disapproved of by the majority of Parisians. I'm quoting from his letters. They think that it risks um, lighting up or re-relighting the, the memories of the past. That is, that is the fires of the revolution are going to start again. And the architect Fontaine writes that the ceremony by reviving memories of a epoch funeste, a fatal period, has spread consternation in all minds. But that evening, 
the prefect of police wrote to reassure the king and said that um, there was a huge crowd in, in surrounding the procession with his homage and his respects. A religious silence reigned wherever the, the procession passed. So you take your pick as to the reactions. Probably most people did were worried by it and did disapprove of it. There'd already been one memorial service for Louis XVI at Notre Dame in May 1814. Here's another in January 1815. And the king had promised in his constitutional charter that everything would be forgotten about the revolution. But here is this formal reburial of the king and queen. And there is a requiem mass by Cherubini, wonderful music. There is a sermon that went on for five hours. So they're buried in style. And until 1830, when the Bourbons were overthrown again, there would be annual memorial services for Louis XVI every January anniversary of his guillotining, as there would be every 16th of October for Marie Antoinette anniversary of her guillotining. And not content with this magnificent and perhaps impolitic memorial service, the king builds a chapel in his brother's memory. And he erects statues, the last royal statues in Saint-Denis are of Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette. And that's the interior of Saint-Denis for the memorial service of, of Louis XVI, by, again by Dugouc. All these drawings are in the Louvre. And here are these, these really rather magnificent statues of Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette in Saint-Denis. And for some reason, not no one has been able fully to explain, previous Bourbons did not have grand tombs or statues. The Valois did, you can see them, Henri II and Catherine de Médicis and François Ier and others in Saint-Denis. But Louis XVI, uh, Henri IV, Louis XIII, Louis XIV, reject, Louis XV rejected them, possibly out of a sign of Christian humility or possibly out of dynastic tradition. So they were, they just had simple tombs in the crypt, the tombs we earlier saw being um, disturbed. And we, so here are these wonderful statues. They were erected soon after 1815. They are by Edme Gaul and Pierre Petitot. And they're not the only statues to Louis the 16th and Marie Antoinette. They really, the, the Bourbons really, um, they buried back, they buried back against the revolution and the Republic. They made sure the Bourbons were not forgotten. Here is the Chapelle Expiatoire that I think you're going to be seeing at the trip to France. It's on the Boulevard Haussmann. It's built by Pierre Fontaine, the premier architect du roi, who had also been Napoleon's architect. He, he's rather reticent about it all, but it's a fine neoclassical monument and all around are the tombs of the Swiss guards who died defending the Tuileries Palace on the 10th of August, 1792, when it was attacked by a Paris crowd and Marseille. So it's a full memorial to victims of the revolution. Let's go inside and you see a magnificent statue by Bozio, premier sculptor du roi, to Louis the 16th going to heaven wearing royal robes and below him is the, uh, the words of his last will and testament which he wrote just before his guillotining which was read out in the annual memorial services in churches throughout France every 21st of January, which basically preaches forgiveness. It's not counter-revolutionary, it's anti-revolutionary, if anything, but above all, it's a Christian document preaching forgiveness. And here is the pair to it 
the statue of Marie Antoinette by Courteau, and she's consoled by religion who has the features of her sister-in-law, Louis XVI's sister, Madame Elizabeth, who is also a victim of the guillotine. And below it is her last letter to Madame Elizabeth, also preaching forgiveness and um, recommending her children to her sister-in-law's care. And here you see the interior of the Chapelle Expiatoire as it was used by royalists and Parisians after it was finished in the 1820s. Uh, there's a, an inscription in the chapel, King Louis XVIII raised this monument to consecrate the place where the mortal remains of King Louis XVI and Queen Marie Antoinette transferred on the 21st of January 1815 to the royal tomb of Saint-Denis reposed for 21 years. It was finished during the second year of the reign of Charles X, Year of Grace, 1826. And not just the king and queen were reburied in Saint-Denis, but all the previous members of the royal family whose remains have been thrown into a common grave. Here you see a picture by F.J. Heim of the remains being dug up in preparation for reburial, Christian reburial inside Saint-Denis. A magnificent picture, very typical of the sort of neo-romantic, neo-troubadour style of the restoration. And even the king's aunts who died in emigration in Trieste, the remains were repatriated to France for reburial in Saint-Denis, Madame Adelaide and Madame Victoire. And not just, there was another royal victim, the Duc d'Anguien, the last of the House of Condé, who was kidnapped and shot by Napoleon in 1804 in the, in the uh, fosse, the, the moat of the Chateau of Vincennes. And here is a memor memorial which was erected to him by his father in 1816. Very elegant, very neoclassical, marking the spot where he fell before the firing squad. And later, his father built a magnificent memorial, which I didn't even know existed until I was researching this talk, inside the chapel of the Chateau of Vincennes. There is a, a Saint-Chapelle in Paris, but there's also one in Saint-Germain and one in Vincennes, because they were both royal palaces. That's the memorial. And here is the monument to the Duc d'Anguien. And it shows uh, France in tears on the left, crime on the right as a young man holding a dagger and with serpents round his wrist. And in the back, you see the Duc d'Anguien himself consoled by religion. And here you see it. And the first thing I'll visit when we can get back to Paris, I'll go and see it. It was in the middle of the chapel. And then when Napoleon III became emperor, he was so ashamed of what his uncle had done to the Duc d'Anguin, it was moved into a side chapel. Again, a magnificent neoclassical monument by Saint-Pierre. And there were quite a lot of reburials going on. This is when Louis Philippe as Duc d'Orléans is beginning to rebury members of his family in the chapel at Dreux. But what is stark striking is that on the whole families and cities which had suffered from the revolution are very reticent about commemorating their victims. This is the Garden of Picpus, the uh, where many victims of the guillotine were buried by their families, but the monuments are extremely reticent. Lafayette is there because his wife lost her sister, her mother, and her grandmother. Tocqueville is there, many other prominent and distinguished families. But 
just these very modest monuments. There is a sort of silence about the victims of the revolution as if they want to forget. So the Noai or the Duc de Brissac, whose, whose ancestors died in horrible circumstances, I know of no great monuments to them, whereas they would have had splendid monuments in the 18th century to whichever member of the family died. And Nantes, thousands of priests and others were drowned in Nantes. It's known as the Noyade de Nantes, the drownings of Nantes in 1793 to 4, but I know of no monument to them. In Lyon, about 2,000 people died during the siege of Lyon when the city of Lyon had turned against the Republic in Paris. And some, when the city fell, many Lyonnais, various people of all classes, humble people were shot in horrible circumstances. They were, they were called mitraillades, the cannon fire just destroy, destroyed a lot of people at the same time. And there was a monument to them, this pyramid uh, built with the encouragement of the future Charles X of France from 1816, an elegant neoclassical pyramid. But strikingly enough, 1906, when there is a separation of the church and state under the Third Republic and the government becomes anti-clerical, this pyramid is destroyed. But the remains were moved to this, the crypt of this church and here they are, skulls, which were, had been preserved in what's called whitewash, shum. I don't know why that should preserve skulls, but they, they were preserved. And in the middle, the altar is a monument to the Comte de Précy, who had commanded the defense of Lyon against um, the armies of the Convention. Here you see it again. And this memory of Lyon, which had remained Republican while resisting the convention, has been captured, I've, from, from what I've read, by the ultra-right. In fact, it was the whole city that was against the convention, but this has been turned slightly into a right-wing anti-revolutionary shrine. This is the names of the victims all ordinary Lyonnais. And this is a small monument outside Angers to 99 priests. And again, the list of names is extraordinary. Lots of ordinary 40 to 50 year old women above all. Marie Pew, for example. And um, why they were killed isn't recorded. But these are among the rare monuments to victims of the revolution, apart from those put up by the French royal family. And 1820, uh, the king's nephew is assassinated and there's a magnificent funeral, a lying in state in the Louvre. This drawing is by Henri Lecomte and a grand funeral in Saint-Denis, again, with a magnificent catafalque. But no grand tomb, although there is a monument to him in Lille, because he's the last Bourbon to have this tradition of the entrails and heart being buried separately. His entrails were buried in Lille, a city he knew well, and his heart is buried at Rony, the his country house and this wonderful hospice was built by his widow, by the neoclassical architect Frölicher, and his heart is buried somewhere underground under this hospice in the chapel. Eighteen twenty-four, uh, the death of Louis the Eighteenth, the last ruler to die on the throne magnificent lying in state and this is really the triumph the 
aspect of these funerals, the apogee of the French royal funeral. It's very grand indeed. Uh, the Chapelle Ardon, all of Paris wears mourning. Maybe it was the fashion, maybe some Parisians were grateful for the king's attempts to limit the horrors of foreign occupations. Uh, the boss, the theatres, everything is closed. Um, 40,000 Parisians went past, according to contemporary accounts, in one day, filing through the Tuileries Palace to see the lying in state. Uh, the throne room, by the way, had recently been redecorated by Dugouk. Never for anything, according to a Chamberlain of Napoleon, has there been such crowds. The whole week the Tuileries was besieged to see the throne room. And also the palace had been surrounded by crowds as the king was dying, as indeed Versailles had been when Louis XIV was dying. And 23rd of September, there's a magnificent funeral procession. There it is, leaving the Tuileries Palace, going through Paris to Saint-Denis. Uh, Louis XIV had avoided Paris. Louis XVIII is going through Paris. All the church bells are pealing. There are on our um, salvos by artillery. All the windows were filled and all the streets crowded until Saint-Denis, according to the Comte de Rumigny, and all along the road to Saint-Denis. And so the funeral was really very grand and the Marquis de Drebrézé, the Grand Master of Ceremonies, who is the same man who had been there in 1789 uh, when Mirabeau denounced him, he was very pleased and he said all foreigners said the ceremonies were better even than those at St. Peter's, Rome. And here is the hearse of Louis XVIII, which you can see now in the stables at Versailles. And it had been used for Maréchal Lannes under the Empire. It was later used for the Duc d'Orléans under the July monarchy for King Jerome under the Second Empire, and for President Carnot, who was assassinated in 1894 under the Third Republic. So regimes change, but state funerals go on. Again, the 19th century is really the golden age of the state funeral. And here it is again, here is a ticket to the king's funeral, 25th of October, 1825. Nobody is allowed to enter unless they're wearing mourning. The ladies will be draped in black. And here is a picture of the funeral of Saint-Denis. You slightly have the feeling that the restoration was chock-a-block with funerals as um, some people complained. And here exhibited now at Saint-Denis are the models of the heraldic costumes and swords used for the funeral of the king. But the swords were broken ritually as his body uh, was lowered into the earth, according to traditional rituals. But these funerals, they weren't enough for the royal family. And Louis XVI's surviving child, his daughter, Marie-Thérèse Charlotte, insisted with tears in her eyes that a statue be built in honor of her father on the spot in the Place de la Concorde where he had been guillotined. So the Chapelle Expiatoire and Saint-Denis weren't enough for her. And this is a picture by Joseph Baum 3rd of May, 1826, of the inauguration, the, the laying of the first stone of the statue. She herself is not there, but the royal family is there and the church, you see how, how tactless it was. The church is very, very prominent and dominant in this ceremony. 
So it's not entirely a surprise with this overemphasis on royal funerals. And really it is Louis XVI's daughter, in my opinion, trying to make people feel even more guilty or more resentful or more uh, opposed, antagonistic. And in 1830, for other reasons really, there is the July Revolution and Louis Philippe, the Duc d'Orléans, becomes king not of France, but of the French. And there are many grand state funerals in his reign. There is the funerals for the victims of the July Revolution, who are also commemorated every year, every July. And there is the funerals of Marshal Mortier in 1835, when there had been what is known as the Attentat de Fieschi, and hundreds had died with an, an, an infernal machine exploded in the route of the Royal Parade, and Louis Philippe escaped by a miracle. And there's a grand ceremonial funeral, all Paris comes to a halt, and even more, all Paris comes to a halt for the ceremonial reburial of Napoleon in 1840. His remains are brought back from St. Helena. There's a, this procession through Paris, 15th of December, 1840, a vast funeral catafalque, bigger than those of Louis XVI or Louis XVIII. And of course, he's buried in the church of the Invalides. And it was said, it was a very cold day, and it was said that even in his, at his burial, the emperor killed people. People died because of him. <laughs> um, and there are other grand funerals. 1842, the king's very promising, very popular son, the Duc d'Orléans, dies in a carriage accident. And there is a magnificent funeral at Saint-Denis for him. And everybody says, this is the end of the July monarchy. It's a very bad day for France. Um, Alfred de Musset wrote that a, a century changed in a minute, i.e. everybody knew the July monarchy with the aging Louis Philippe was doomed. But he had time to build some magnificent memorials to his adored elder son, Ferdinand Philippe, Duc d'Orléans. Here, it's been moved to near the Boulevard Périphérique, is a chapel commemorating his accident, Notre Dame de la Compassion. And inside is a superb funeral sculpture by Henri de Triquetti. You see here, and Ang did drawings for stained glass windows with saints, which all have the features of the royal family of the House of Orléans. So you see St. Ferdinand with the features of the dead prince. He's not only commemorated in marble, but also in stained glass in the chapel. And here are two members of his family. On the left is um, his mother, Marie Amélie, Saint Amelia. On the right, Saint Raphael. I think it's his brother, the Duc de Nemours. I'm, I'm not certain. And even Louis Philippe, extraordinarily enough, is rep who wasn't a believing Christian, is represented as Saint Philip in these wonderful stained glass windows triumphs of the art of stained glass in 19th century France. Somehow they've survived world wars and occupation. And here is another model by Trichetti for the funeral effigy in the Museum of Montargis. You see what an extraordinary artist Trichetti was and he's used because the two royal families had many intermarriages between the Coburgs and the Orléans, 
and there's the entente cordiale between the two countries there's also an entente funéraire because he's used by queen victoria for prince albert's cenotaph in the albert memorial chapel in st george's windsor but 1848 the french royal family flees to England. Louis-Philippe lives in Clermont. He dies there in 1850. And of course, there is a funeral for him. This is a drawing by Eugène Lamy, who is the favorite artist of the Orleans. And he's temporarily buried in a Catholic church in Weybridge, the church of St. Charles Borromeo, before later being moved back when politics permits to um, Dreux in France. Here is the lying in state of his widow, Queen Marie-Amélie, in Clermont in 1866. There's no let up of French royal funerals, even when they're deposed. And I, I meant to say there was a very grand funeral for Louis XVIII's wife in Westminster Abbey in 1810 during the emigration. No monument, unfortunately. But... Um, all the English royal family sent their carriages. There was a huge procession through London. Lots of members of the public watched and Napoleon was infuriated. His police agents were there. He saw it as a sort of assertion of sovereignty in exile, as indeed this funeral is for Marie-Amélie. And here is the magnificent marble memorial 1876 in the chapel of Dreux, which he himself had created by Marius Mercier of Louis Philippe and Marie-Emilie. And here is another memorial of his elder son, the Duc d'Orléans, with his wife, Hélène. It's by Loisin after Harry Scheffer. And Hélène, she's buried outside because she's a Protestant and her hand is reaching out to him. And 1883, the last Bourbon of the elder line, who'd been living in exile in Austria, the Comte de Chambord, known to his adherents as Henri V, has a magnificent funeral. Here he is leaving his chateau of Froschdorf, south of Vienna, and he's buried with his grandfather and his uncle, the Duc d'Angoulême, in Gorizia, which is the Saint-Denis of exile. It's a city half in Italy and half in Slovenia, but the crypt of the Bourbons is in Slovenia. And here it is, buried in state, far from France, because their own politics had led to their expulsion. And Henri V didn't accept, he refused, the throne of France in 1873 because he wouldn't accept the tree colour. So we've come to the end of our story but there's still another final funeral of Louis-Philippe's grandson who's living in exile by then, the Comte de Paris. He dies at Stowe, the wonderful house outside Aylesbury, which he rented and he's buried with other Orléans at Weybridge in 1894. This really is the end of all French monarchical pretensions or serious ones. And here is Farnborough, which we all visited a few uh, last year. And that's my book. That, and here is, just to conclude, Versailles, the research center of Versailles, if you want to pursue this story, they have published a magnificent three volume book on royal funerals in Europe from the 16th to the 18th centuries. But I hope I've shown today that the real grandiose royal funerals are in the 19th century. Thank you very much. Philip, thank you very much indeed for, for that. Um, do we have any questions to Philip? Um, as I said, I haven't seen any come through yet, um, but um, we'll give it a moment or two to see if there are any coming through. 
Absolutely fascinating talk, Philip. I mean, what fascinates me, again, as in your book about Louis XIV, is this sort of discovery of detail, all these chapels in Paris. Yes. Um, and, and the amazingly beautiful sculpture. Yes. Um, and also, the, the uh, something I didn't know, that Louis XVIII's wife had a funeral in Westminster Abbey. Yes. Just, uh, just amazing, really, to discover all of that. Uh, to discover all of that. It's a sign that that how much he was secretly supported by the British government. I mean, they were fight, they were both fighting Napoleon. And she's later reburied formally in Sardinia, which is where her family is then reigning. Right, it doesn't doesn't look as though we've got any any questions coming through. So you've obviously completely um Floored everybody with the with the information. So, um, Philip, thanks thanks once again for. Um, oh, the, hang on, we've got a question coming. Two questions coming. Sorry, I spoke too soon. Um, I don't know whether you can see this, Philip, uh, but if you can't, was any music composed specifically for any royal funerals? If some, was it in Latin or French? That's from Pam Armstrong. Yes, that's a very good question. It, there are there are wonderful Cherubini requiem masses. There were yes, there's a lot of music, specially com composed for Louis the Sixteenth, and uh, I think it's in French. I think it's a great statement. So it's, they want it to be understood by as many people as possible, and you can get CDs of it. I have listened to it. It's ten. I think there are special requiem masses for Louis the Sixteenth, for Louis the Eighteenth, for new anniversary, uh, annual anniversary services, but they're very similar to each other. I think Le Sueur also wrote music. Another question: um, the person doesn't uh, give their name. In the funeral for Louis the Eighteenth, were there any innovations or anything added based on his long exile in other parts of Europe, Austria, Mittau, England, etc.? Not to my knowledge. I think they're very keen to keep up the family traditions. I think the change would be they would have had to make sure that the Chamber of Peers and the Chamber of Deputies have really grand seats so nobody's feelings were offended to show the king is a constitutional monarch, according to the constitution. Um, and there must have been minor innovations. Probably the army had a more prominent part. Marshals of France probably had better seating than they had done before as a separate body in the state. But I don't think there's anything else. One innovation in 1820 is that Louis XVIII attends his nephew's funeral, although traditionally the monarch doesn't attend other people's funerals. So Queen Victoria didn't attend Wellington's funeral. But because political passions were so fierce in 1820, he had to attend his nephew's funeral, otherwise he would have been blamed by ultra-royalists for not doing so because his favourite minister, de Cars, had been accused of murdering his nephew. Um, I think the innovation is just the scale, and the, I am sure more troops would have been massed to escort the hearse and so on. More, more militarization. everything is militarised in the 19th century. Question from Anthony Garrity. Thank you for a splendid talk. Can you say more about how these traditions continue in Republican France uh, in relation to presidents? Well, the wonderful exhibition on uh, Louis XIV's funeral in 2015 did stress the continuity with President Sadi Carnot's funeral because he was had a very grand funeral because he'd been assassinated while performing his duties. Um, and they use the same hearse as Louis XVIII. I'm, a f I'm ashamed to say that I haven't studied Republican funerals, but it, I'm sure they're more Catholic than 
would have been expected for the secular French Republic. And I remember watching Pompidou's funeral in Notre Dame, and it seemed very Catholic to me. De Gaulle's funeral was in Colombe les Deux Églises. Um, but as is always said, the Fifth Republic is a Republican monarchy or a monarchical republic, and, and the position of president is like that of a king. And the, uh, the question from Sam Swash about embalming techniques, I'm ashamed to say I haven't studied them, but they're very professional and nothing really goes wrong. And <clears throat> there's a whole, and also James II had this embalming and splitting of his body in 1701. One always forgets that there are two sets of royal tombs, the Stuarts in exile, James II and Mary of Modena, as well as the Bourbons in France, and they too are destroyed during the revolution. Um, but I think other, I think embalming was really quite common and uh, it, it, there would have been good professional embalmers in France in the 19th century, but I, I'm ashamed to say I haven't studied the technique. I'm not sure if um, everybody can see the questions, uh, but there's one from Celia Hopkinson. Was there ever a tradition of burying different bits of the body in different places in England? Not as far as I know. It's French and it's Catholic. And so James II is buried as a French king or really as a Catholic saint, not as a king of England. I think they're buried whole, even, even kings who are regarded as martyrs like Henry VI or Edward II or Richard II. Um, I think it's specifically French, but there are also other prominent French people sometimes had the bits of their bodies separated and buried in different places. There's a, there's a question on the, the chat as well. Yeah, um, there's, there's one from Kate Daly and then we'll go to the chat, um, which I think you, you can see, Philip. Did the funeral of Louis XVIII's wife in Westminster Abbey, which um, obviously yes. we talked about indirectly earlier, use Roman Catholic rites? And, and if so, which clergy conducted it? Just an interesting question. It's a very good question. It's, I've written about it in a book called The History of the French in London that came out a few years ago, a, a group volume. There was a French royal chapel near Portman Square, near King Street, and her, she had a full royal funeral mass there done by the French Catholic clergy of London, of whom there were many a lot of the Catholic churches in London were started by French emigre priests. And then the body goes to Westminster Abbey. It is greeted by the dean and chapter of Westminster, of course, and the Anglicans take over. I don't know if, I mean, all her household is with her and the royal family and the emigres. Presumably some Catholic priests must have accompanied the body, but maybe not many. But what the accounts specify is that the th three choirs the, of the Chapel Royal of Westminster Abbey and of St Paul's Cathedral, three Anglican choirs sing during her formal burial in a crypt, the crypt under the Henry the Seventh Chapel. So I think it's just a choral funeral service, not, not actually a mass or a Catholic rite in Westminster Abbey. Nevertheless, it's the first service with a Catholic aspect since, since the Reformation. One final um, question, Philip. Um, it's from Katharina Kosia. Um, I was wondering, she was wondering about the role of the successor in the funeral. 
did the new king take part or keep away? The king always kept away. And possibly it's because uh, up to the funeral of Henri IV, the king's effigy and corpse were still treated as the living king for a few days until his burial. So food was brought to him. So there couldn't be two kings in the same space. Anyway, I think in other monarchies also the monarch kept away because the monarch shouldn't be associated with death. And certainly Louis XVI didn't go to Louis XV's funeral and Charles X didn't go to Louis XVIII's funeral. They kept away, it's, it's the end of one reign and the new reign is meant to begin as a, a joyous beginning and anyway monarchs didn't attend funerals. Good. I think that's an appropriate last question and last answer <laughs> on that. Philip, once again, thank you very much indeed for, um, for a, a really um, lovely talk.